The United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. The business community has a strong reaction to the president's withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. Many prominent companies, including IBM, ExxonMobil, and Amazon, support the accord. More than two dozen companies, including oil giant Shell, Apple, Facebook, General and Electric Morgan CEO State. Jeff Immelt tweeted, quote, climate change is real. Industry must now lead and not depend on government. It was just an enormous response of businesses saying, unlike 10 years ago, they're willing to step up to the plate, they're willing to be part of the solution, not part of the problem, and they're willing to act. This is not about good guys versus bad guys, East Coast versus West Coast, blue states versus green states. It is about whether or not we have enough jobs. It is about whether our industries stay strong. The agricultural industry can't be strong if climate keeps getting worse and storms are ruining their crops. The insurance industry will not stay strong if they're paying $40 billion in payouts on average a year for the property and casualty insurance sector because of climate-related increased storms. The clothing industry, who rely on the cotton crop, do not do well when the cotton crop dies due to droughts caused by climate change. What we found was not 10 companies or 20 companies, but 50 companies and then 100 companies, and we're now at 500 plus, who wanted to stand up and make the case that acting on climate was in their own self-interest as well as in the public interest. For us, it's bringing in some who people felt would be against climate regulation, who people felt in the past opposed climate regulation, but we're seeing quite the opposite, that businesses understand the need to act, they're starting to act, and from all the most unsuspecting places. And if Washington doesn't want to listen to environmental leaders or scientists, they will listen to the major corporate leaders and financial leaders when they call for change and change now. Well, it ended, we are still in, and we are all still in, on how to take on the issues of the sustainability, the sustainable development goals. Uh, today is about we are the future. It is about how we take on the problems addressed in the sustainable development goals, how we take on boldly, innovatively, with a passion, with time constraints, the issues of climate change, of water shortages, the issue of poverty and not having enough food. The goals are very clear, some things so audacious that they can't be met. And what I will say is, they probably can't be met by government alone, and they can't be met by one country, but they can be met and they must be met, given that we're talking about humanity and our future and what my kids' future looks like. They can be met if we bring people together, if we build the future in a different way. I'm gonna introduce Mahmoud Khan, who is a leader at PepsiCo, uh, and ask him to talk about how corporate America, who 10 years ago, we all might have said they are not in. They are not there to fight climate change, to fight water shortages, to deal with the waste issues, to deal with poverty issues and food problems. But 10 years later, I think that has changed. We're talking today about behavioral change. Let's ask Dr. Khan, what is it about corporate America today that's different than 10 years ago? And I don't mean to say there were not leaders like PepsiCo who 10 years ago were acting, but the amount of passion, the number of companies who see addressing the issues of the sustainability goals as their own goals, as well as some goals that the United Nations may perhaps care about. The change has been clear. Talk about behavioral change. This is a place to dig in, to look at, because it is clearly part of the solution. So what's brought the change? How do you look at things? We know how you look at building a company like PepsiCo, but you have engaged on the challenges that the sustainable development goals address. How do you think about them, and what's in it for you? I think right in the center of 
this whole climate discussion at the end of the day is the food supply of the businesses in the food supply chain. Agriculture, food production, manufacturing, distribution. We're not going to touch, we recognize this over a decade ago, we're not going to be able to address the global challenge of water, carbon, climate change, without taking on the whole end-to-end -end of our food supply. Look, somewhere around three-quarters of fresh water use is agriculture on the planet. Somewhere around 70% of greenhouse gas production is in the generation of food. So no matter what you do in your home with your faucet or your shower or anything, like, until we touch this, that was going to be. So that was the first thing. Now the second is, how do you mobilize and why did you mobilize, right? Those are the questions. Consumers are better informed. They're asking for that transparency. Employees are our consumers. We have large workforces. And in this generation in particular, where we're actually have a challenge and we're competing for the best talent, young graduates coming out of school, they're asking, how am I going to be making a difference when I work in your organization? This, I mean, frankly, when I came out of school in the 80s, that wasn't the number one question we were asking when we were in a job interview. 2017, these young graduates, they're asking. Well, great, great, Dr. Khan, this is good, but tell me how I'm going to make a difference. Our employees are asking for it. Policymakers, directly or indirectly, asking that question. NGOs are asking that question. So we live in a world, appropriately, where that's going to become a necessity. And over the last decade, there's been greater and greater alignment on what it is. Now, there's going to be differences in terms of how we might execute, and we'll get into that. But to me, that's done. What we really need to talk about is how. I have no question in my mind of the should we. We're past that. We're more than a decade past that. Now, not everybody might not be there, but most you know, of the large corporations that I know of in our sector, they're, they're there. So you've taken a shot at setting goals around water, around human rights, around diversity, around climate change, around your waste, uh, around how you deal with farmers and how you teach them. How audacious are those goals? I mean, we need big, bold solutions if yeah. we're going to meet some of the goals of the Sustainable Development Goals. Well, let's think about how, as an industry and then within PepsiCo, how we've transformed this. And any reflection or criticism I might have, I have to say that 10 years ago when I joined the company, I was one of the leaders, their architect, it was the architect in helping put those goals together and now in more this 2025 version, I actually chaired it. So as I look back, we've come in with 10 years of knowledge. Let me give you an example. We used to talk about how we're going to reduce our water use in our operating plants by X percent. Great. It wasn't easy. We brought down our water use by 20 some percent. And we knew we were the industry leaders. Some of you might know in 2014, our team won the Stockholm Water Prize for being leaders, okay? And everybody was celebrating, and then we're sitting back in, in our offices saying, well, yeah, that's, but isn't gonna cut it. Same with greenhouse gas, we said, let's cut our carbon emissions by 20% in our operations. Sounds great. In my office and the leadership, we actually weren't celebrating. It was industry leading, but the question was initially, what do, how much can we reduce? And yet the question should have been, how much do we need to reduce in order to change the trajectory of our planet? That's a very different question. Because 90% of my industry's greenhouse gas footprint is actually outside our operations. So if you cut your operational impact by 20%, you're cutting 20% of 7%. Right? That doesn't move the needle. And so the question when you ask about audacious, somebody asked me, well, you know, your, your goal is now based on what? We're not the experts of this. We looked at the UN SDGs and said, well, if two degrees centigrade is the target, if we, if we just accept that and stop debating it, and then we work back from that and say, not how much can we reduce, but what do we need to reduce by in order for PepsiCo's footprint to be brought down so we contribute our part of that two degree, but not stop there, of our systems footprint, which is scope one, two, and three, which means take on 
that other 90%. And we can get into a bit, you know, we were talking earlier about how, but until you commit to that other 90%, that otherwise is looked at as that somebody else's problem. It's not. It's our collective problem. How do we change it? Well, let's talk about that. You must have 10,000 growers or tens of thousands mm -hmm. um, who are out there working for you, delivering goods and products. How do you control their water use, yeah. their carbon footprint, how they treat their workers, and what they're doing to make sure they get the most out of farming so we could eventually deal with the fact that people won't go hungry? Great question, and we asked ourselves this question first about five years ago, and we set one of those crazy audacious goals. You know, when you're sitting in the C-suite, you sort of send out these memos and say, guys, this is what we've got to deliver on. That's easy because you don't have to do it. Your team has to do it. And uh, that's the privilege of having gray hairs. <laughs> so we said, what if we took a pilot, a reasonable size, commercial operating farms, and, and we actually picked our pilot to be in England, in the southeast of England where we have potato farms that grow potatoes for us. And we said, look, here's a few criteria. No more new inventions. So this is not a pilot to see if we can find new technology. You know, I spent all my career in science. This is not about inventing anything. This is about taking what we already have and deploying it and learning how best to deploy it, number one. So I don't want an academic grant to study another research project. I used to do that, but Move on. Second, let us set a goal that we're going to do, and this is sound crazy, but we said cut water use on those potato farms by 50% and cut greenhouse gas production by 50%. Sounds crazy. And then, here's the other clinch, yield on those farms per acre cannot go down. Because these farmers, at the end of the day, they're entrepreneurs, they're business people, they have livelihoods, and if you say, well, do this, do this, but don't worry about your yield, it ain't going to work. So we set off and did that. But then we said, we can't measure the impact of this ourselves, so let's find a credible partner. So we went to the University of Cambridge in England, partnered with a technology company who could map and get all this, and then we deployed everything that we had available. Sensors, drip irrigation, uh, the appropriate use of nitrogen, etc. Did everything that we knew how to do and did it. Five years later, the end of 2016, we just released those results, first quarter of this year. Guess what happened? Water use went by half, carbon production went down by half, the yield didn't decline. We didn't invent a single new thing. We call that the Sustainable Farming Initiative. So now we're rolling and mapping out our supply chain of, of farmers on different crops. Our footprint is about 10 million acres around the world. We've already now, under the SFI, getting data from one million acres in over 15 countries. That's five years into the initiative. Our plan, and my hope is, that by 2025 we'll have mapped out at least 70% of that, seven million acres in over 30 countries, small and large. And partnered now, the data set is being housed in a division of the United Nations. And my ambition is, that as we learn, these farmers looking at your question, how do you incentivize them? They don't work for us. They can grow for us today. They could choose to grow for my competitor tomorrow. It doesn't matter. But if we can show them best practices, two things will happen. If you show somebody a distribution curve and say, by the way, you are here, and Farmer Joe, your neighbor four acres down, is here in the same region, guess what they're going to do? They're entrepreneurs. They say, well, how do I get over to here? And nitrogen costs money. In many parts of the world, water costs money. These are input costs, so that's one. The second is that as we do this, we're hoping that we can interrogate this data set and truly find best practices for different crops, by different regions, across borders. This is borderless. This data set is, acc is accumulating. And I'm hoping universities will come to the table and say, we want to study this. We want to. So it, it, when I listen to you, you, one would say, it just makes sense. Um, where are the blockages? Do, uh, are there blockages at PepsiCo where somebody, investors, board members say, look, if it's not going to show up in quarterly earnings, we shouldn't be doing that? Or is it full speed ahead and do you have full buy-in, number one? And number two, how do we turbocharge 
you know, I'll use a silly term, corporate America. There's no, it doesn't mean, but how do we make sure that others like you see the benefits, have the buy-in, we can't accomplish the sustainable development goals, and they must be met. We must meet those goals without partnerships yeah. with the private sector. So let me address your question in two aspects. There's the organizational, and then there's the external, right? Very quickly on the organizational, you know, when Indra Nui, you kicked this whole initiative off 10 years ago, and I was hired 10 years ago, soon after she became CEO, uh, as we've rolled this out, we used to have a sustainability group over in government affairs and communication who really rolled this. And when I became chair of the sustainability agenda and the committee for the company, first thing I did was eliminate my job. First, for those of you who want to do it, put yourself out of a job. There should not be a sustainability office and then the operating business. Because then this is reputational, it's sort of policy engagement, all of which is critical, but it's not core to the business. So I'll give a very quick example so we're short on time. We have a CapEx approval process. Every business does. There's no CapEx that goes through PepsiCo now without a sign-off on the sustainability line. You can't buy a manufacturing machine or install equipment on, a, on production anywhere without the sustainability office signing off on it. It's not trading off. So you change your decision-making processes. You change your incentives. We have a board subcommittee called the Sustainability Committee of the Board of Directors. That's where it starts. The executive board of the company the executive, is the Sustainability Committee, by the way. I'm not it. R&D, of course, reports into me. Of course, there is no project starting in R&D without that lens because I'm accountable for both. It truly is embedding it organizationally. Now, on the outside, yeah, if you want to make money for the next 30 days, you could probably shut R&D down completely. You still, you'd actually improve your bottom line. Probably do it for 60 days. Might even get away for 90 days. The question is, what are you investing? Pepsi's been in the business for 100 years. We hope to be in business 100 years from now. It is not, and I'll finish with this, I have no doubt in my mind there will be a food and beverage industry and an agricultural industry 100 years from now, so long as we have a viable planet. 90% of the world's foods are through the private sector. The question is not that. The question is which companies will have transformed themselves to be the food and beverage and agricultural companies of the future. And do we have the courage as leaders to transform ourselves while we're succeeding today? Great. A and that is what we've got to see. The company's got to do well to be able to work on these things. But unless it is embedded from the boardroom to the supply chain, where everybody in the leadership team is thinking about water, is thinking about human rights, is thinking about food resources, is thinking about climate change, it doesn't happen. A model as we just heard Dr. Khan talk about, that makes sense. It's got to be embedded from the boardroom all the way through to the supply chain. You cannot stop and say our goals are just about what we could do at headquarters. You know, you may have a lot of paper you could recycle better, but their big footprint is out in the field. It is in offices, it is around the world with supply chains, and taking on a holistic view of sustainability in a way that works for the company is the only option. And frankly, the only option where we're going to deal with the kind of extraordinary goals that have been set by the sustainability goals, but with the bold action, I actually listen and have hope that we could get there. Uh, why don't we take some questions? Starting right here in the front, and then we'll go to the woman who's halfway up. So you're a second. Hi, um, my name is Maggie Dupree. Uh, I run a global community called the League of Intrapreneurs, so people inside organizations like PepsiCo innovating on the SDGs. And I have a question for you around the competencies and kind of cultural norm shifts that you see needing to, to deliver on the how. Um, how are you thinking about new competencies? Are there gaps? And um, yeah, if you could talk about the kind of talent component of the how. Yeah. So let me contextualize this and give you real examples. If you look at my executive team today, the, it's a direct report to my office, 100% of them were not at the company or in any of these roles when I came. It truly required either retraining people that were already in the company, 
and am infusing them with people from different industries. We had to bring people in. For, I, I mean, our water, uh, our lead for agriculture came from NASA. It's not the sort of person a food company would probably hire, right? My head of um, strategy came from Merck. Why? Because that was an industry I happened to come who thinks about long-term development. Our industry talk, talks about development on a two-year cycle. The pharmaceutical industry thinks about a 10-year cycle. If we're going to do this, you have to change those time horizons. So those are examples. And by the way, for the women in the room, when I joined the company, 100% of my direct reports were male, Caucasian, and white. And the amazing thing was, as I looked at this audience, says, by the way, 60% of the shoppers that buy our products are women, and half the world's population outside the U.S. and Western Europe are people of color who buy our products. Um, sitting in New York and Chicago isn't going to cut it. And so today, more than half of my direct reports are women. Okay? And so you have to have the courage as a leader. Not and I wasn't doing it because I got to count the diversity numbers. I completely disagree with that. I was doing it to say, until I have diversity of thought, at the table, we're not going to transform. So the real answer to the question is, do you have the different perspectives at the table as a leader, and are you, do you have the courage to listen to them? Those are the two things. It isn't good just to have them at the table, but do you have the courage to listen and then follow on? And that's what changed it. Great. We'll go to you, but uh, one quick, it doesn't hurt to have a woman named Indra Nui, who runs PepsiCo, the CEO, um, who is not a Caucasian white male. Uh, and, and neither am I, by the way. <laughs> and who, like I was just going to say, our colleague here, uh, they come from different places and have brought different thinking. Yeah. Uh, but, and it shows. Can I just add, look, I'm a second generation, okay? It's very important. My children look different, but they're Minnesota Vikings fans and are about as Midwestern as you can imagine, <laughs> other than their suntan. So that doesn't bring diversity. That was, you have to have diversity of perspective and thought. Just because you look different doesn't necessarily make you different. Thanks for that. I appreciate that. This is Sunday Bridget Jones with the Rockefeller Foundation. I'm wondering, in, in the context of um, corporate benchmarking against the SDGs, what, what is the best incentive for, for companies um, relative to that? Is it ratings? Is it a different kind of engagement with, with companies to really follow the um, accountability um, relative to achieving the, the sustainable development goals? Yeah. It's not about ratings. Everything, I, the examples I've given you, uh, for many of you who follow this, are probably n is news. And yeah, we could do a lot better job at telling the story and all the rest of it. And frankly, I'll quickly move on. It's sometimes I disagree with the way the ratings are done. I get asked the question, okay, Mahmoud, in this rating checklist, uh, who's your chief sustainability officer? And I go, we don't have one. And you go, <laughs> so you ding, get dinged. you get dinged. But I'm not going to change that because it's not about the rating. I really believe the chief sustainability officer is actually the executive board who makes the decisions on the operating side. And if, if they're not the sustainability officer, and I'm not the sustainability officer as the head of innovation and development of the business, then we're not going to change. Then it's rating. So that's one. The second is, think about this. We're going to have a world with two to three billion more people on the planet. 70% of them are going to live in cities. That by 2050, seven billion people will be living in cities. Those cities will not be occupied and, and populated by smallholder farmers. There will be 7 billion consumers supported by 3 billion people in the rural world. If we don't figure this out, we cannot operationalize and grow as a business. It has nothing to do with rating. It's actually thinking through what is a viable operating model that will allow us to survive in a, in a world where a city is 20 million people and you have to drop product from the perimeter through congested streets, our current operating model was built on the fact that you could drive a truck down a highway from Dallas into Chicago in the same day. Today, it takes eight hours to go from the perimeter of a megacity down to the center of the city and back in one day. 
And that's just 50 kilometers. Try driving in Mumbai, Shanghai, Sao Paulo, London, Manhattan. Pick your city, and you can't operate like that anymore. You're shipping air because most of a food package actually is air. And yet you, you can't, the solution isn't, well, I'll grow it locally. How do you grow locally in Mumbai or Shanghai or Calcutta or Manhattan? If you live in Manhattan with three million people, where are you growing your food? By the way, it's not going to happen just in vertical warehouses. Take, take a look outside. So do you, do you understand? So this has to be core of your thinking about growing your business in a new way. You know, what we're seeing with the hundreds of businesses, and we're advocates in working to push change, uh, see bold goals set and actually execute it. It's a number of things, and all the companies are different. Uh, it is their employees. Employees are saying, I want to work for a company that has a vision, a mission beyond just we're going to sell X amount of widgets. Uh, every company is competing for the best and the brightest, and they are finding a motivating force for the present workforce, as well as who you're recruiting matters if you're a sustainability leader. Investors, we work with $13 trillion of investors. Investors with $13 trillion in assets under management, 130 institutional investors in money management. They're now saying, we want companies to be socially responsible and environmentally responsible. And they are prevailing on companies through their engagement to help see that change. Doesn't always happen. Reputational value to a company who has problems with their workforce or with wasting resources, having that called out in a newspaper is never a good thing. Um, so there are multiple things beyond just most companies can't deal anymore, as we, yeah. in the video we saw. If you're an insurance company, if we don't get a handle on climate change, we're going to see more storms. The two storms alone in the United States, we're talking about Texas and we're talking about Florida, are being discussed to cost us $200 billion. Well, that's going to happen and happen again and happen again. There is nothing about our economy that could deal with that in a way that's good. So connecting the drops, being bold and audacious, is not about separating these issues. They've got to be integrated into the core of what a company does, from the boardroom to the supply chain. And that's why Dr. Khan is here. Um, that it is part of whether or not you will have a business in the future or not. Not enough resources, you can't run a company. So change Look, is Mindy, happening. I, uh, may I ask you? Look, you represent a very large investor base. In the, in the, those investors, I mean, surely you're influencing and helping them understand because that's how they've got to realize. And then right. they're going to come back to us. So what is it that you're telling them other than these that said, hey, I will invest for that long term. Well, w we've developed the methodology and others to look at the real risks. Risk, climate risk, not just climate change, water risk. What is, a, what is a PepsiCo without enough water? Not a viable business as far as I could tell. So we are doing the economic analysis, but as well working with the, com with the investors who could then, because they own, shares in almost every one of publicly traded companies and certainly many others, they are now looking at water risk and climate risk and diversity risk as part of their core analysis of a company. Is it enough? We're not quite there. Uh, but your story is exactly what we wanted to share here. It is about behavioral change. Companies weren't necessarily doing the kind of things and the stories we just heard. It is about bold and audacious goals and it is about clarity and focus. And the sustainable development goals, some may think are perfect, not. They address certainly some of society's greatest harms, whether or not my kids are going to have a future. That makes sense. We're not going to get there without a more combined effort and, frankly, leadership from the private sector. I want to thank you. The leadership that you just talked about and that we're seeing every day uh, gives me hope that we will get there. We're in it together. We'll Thanks it. very much. Thank you.